that, that I would kind of get it started with the first four sessions yeah, and kind yeah. of get the direction going mm -hmm. and then pass it around so that it's not personalized, so it doesn't become my group and my, you know, which is what I'm afraid has happened. I, pl I kind of claimed it for myself and those people who don't particularly like me say, well, I don't particularly want to come. Maybe if somebody else were there, I would. Hmm. You, for instance, who seem so good at not ir irritating people <laughs> and not taking people off and not rubbing people the wrong way and not coming at things in such a kind of bellicose manner. <laughs> you know, so I had to, cons I had to consider it. And mm -hmm. the, other al the other alternative is the the body has spoken, you know, they're just saying, kind of uh, begins with an F and it ends with a U and <laughs> just get over it. And I, you know, I can accept that too. I, it's just, it's a hard transition to make in my own mind because I've been so passionate and, and just feeling somehow that that passion would be infectious and that other people would. You know, and maybe something quite contrary has happened. I've just kind of pushed people away and said, and said, if that's what it is, well, we don't want it. And I'm not listening. I'm too busy cheerleading or whatever it is that I'm doing. But it's something. It's something. Because as much as I've tried to sell this thing, even at the uh, strategy forum, Sounded like people were saying, "Well, yeah, it's very important. It really ought to be yeah. something needs. To, yes, indeed, it's a trust issue, and we got to build community and very good. And, but when it comes down to bodies coming down and sitting on the ground, that's not in the equation. And that's where I'm thinking: Well, is that me? Is it that I'm just pushing people away somehow?" At the same time, I'm, I'm inviting them, I'm unintentionally just, you know, making it impossible. I don't know. <laughs> so what does your gut tell you about that? That I'm asking people to do something they don't want to do. So it sounds like there's some, in your gut, there's some truth to this uh, piece about you framing how you want this in such a way as you're getting an answer, not a direct one, but an indirect answer because people aren't showing up. And you're going, ah, I'm looking in the mirror. I think that, I think there's some truth in that. And it, it could be. I'm not saying whether there is or not, but I, what, I, what I'm suggesting is, is that's a, um, a really important place to be. Because if there, I think a lot of what we do in this Occupy movement is hopefully some introspection and some insight and right? yeah, it's like yeah, yeah. are we saying things that are making no sense? Uh, why isn't our message getting across? Are we the ones that are really not the 99%? Are we just the fruitcakes that are <laughs> banging our heads up against the wall? You know, because always been minority, small groups of agitators. Are we just the small groups of agitators? The small group of agitators within the, the small group. Of <laughs> oh yeah, that could that be too. My, when I was first talking to Tiffany, that was one of my concerns. I do not want to be a revolution inside a revolution. I don't want to be running against the grain of the entire Occupy just because I have some ideas that I think need to be heard and aren't being talked about. And she's saying, no, 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 we need this. This is an important aspect and it's uh, it's hard for some people to, to really get a, understand, but I think you're right with this. And it's that I've gotten enough support from enough people going, yeah, boy, yeah, yeah, really, that's, I'm with you and I think you ought to, don't stop. And, you know, and I'm going, okay, okay, <laughs> okay. But then this happens and I'm going, well, it's like mixed messages. I'm getting two contradictory messages at the same time, and I'm trying to put it together inside of one being. What's the message? You're making 
getting a lot of people saying, yeah, yeah, you're doing right, keep going. And what's the other message? That we don't want to participate. How are you getting that message? They don't show up. So this is the message. Yeah, that's this the message. Really right. So to you, you're generating a message internally. That means that people don't want what I'm offering. How else can I read it? You know, how else can I read it? Oh, we've got a few more. <laughs> <laughs> but the other part of me is a kind of defiant that would say, I don't care. I think I'm right. I may not be the warmest personality in the world, but I still think I'm right. Now I can, I'll try and calm down a little bit. <laughs> but I think what I'm saying is, is leading us in a healthy direction, and it needs to be said. And other people are saying it needs to be said, and somebody's got to say. I don't see anybody else stepping up. Mm -hmm. That leaves me. So if I have to take the heat for it, if I have to be the asshole, as it were, <laughs> I, I, you know, I welcome it. I, I'm. I wake up in the morning, be an asshole, get it over with, and you know, move on with the rest of the day. I don't mind being an asshole. You really don't mind? No, no, no. If it's for the right reasons. If it's for the right reasons. That people just don't like what I say. What an asshole. I go, well, yeah, if that's, yeah, right. I welcome it, but. Well, I, I must say, like, I, I, uh, I'm surprised and, and sad for you. Um, because I, I've gotten so much positive feedback from from this happening, like between people in person saying, you know, like we heard in the strategy forum, like I'm really glad this is happening. This is this is one of those like one of the one of the paths we need to be doing as we're doing everything else, and and I think there is a gap between you know intention and action with people and and. And support and, and actual you know mental support and physical support. Everybody's <laughs> yeah Sorry, yeah. Since when did you get a cool cake? This week. <laughs> and and the the comments on the videos too. When I'm posting the videos, like it seems like all all the videos have some comments on them that are like, great job, keep keep this up, guys. You know this needs to be done. Yeah. So so I've seen a lot of positive uh, positive feedback. But. Well, I, I'm sure glad to hear that because I'm willing to take a, a mixed review. So some people saying, oh, please, yeah. and other people saying, yeah, hey, please bring it on. Well, yeah. I'll talk to the people who say, hey, bring it on. Yeah. <laughs> and the people, you know, and hope that other people will come along. But if it's gone, it's kind of the feeling if, if at least the message that you're trying to say is out there, mm -hmm. you can't. It's like you can't play both sides of the net. You hit it over the net, and then you wait to see what comes back. You can't run around and hit it back yourself. That's not, you know, you just whack it out there. Say, here it is. You want to play? And I will try to be less hostile about it all. I mean, this should be more fun. It should be a happy experience. It should be a pleasant experience we're going through. and. Everything seems to get weighed down to so heavy and conflict and it's so easy to get into that negative area, you know. You say, what are we doing here? I didn't volunteer for this. Don't, don't even raise your hand. Just speak. <laughs> it's too small to even the way I work. It's okay. No, but I mean, um, you had said earlier that um, you haven't watched the videos. <laughs> and, and I have. And there are pieces of those videos that um, I get to hear how I speak, and I hear how other people speak, and then I hear some people responding or some people ignoring what other people say, and then I think, uh, wow, there's something for me to learn. Take my little cursor and go, wait a minute. Uh, let's see how that develops here. Great learning tool for, for interpersonal dynamics. I can't think of anything better. I mean, literally, it's looking at the look at the look on your face sometimes, and you can feel it as though you're somebody else in the in the group. Whereas when you're talking, I mean, I get that too from watching this. I can't tell what I look like. 
when I'm speaking. Yeah. I'm so focused on trying to think about what I'm going to say. The last thing you're worried about is, well, how is my mouth going? Right <laughs> but it is, uh, it's, a, it's a, a lost art to be able to empathize and hold, hold how do I look and what do I want to say with some kind of balance so that there's really good communication. I think, I think as our culture, I think we've lost the ability to communicate. And we've given up for a long time because there's been so much lying going on. So much mistrust. Yeah. And that's what the whole first session was talking about, is the lack of trust, and how do you build trust, and how do we get it, and this whole culture teaches you not to trust, teaches that everybody is playing you, everybody's got a hidden agenda, everybody's selling something, everybody's got a thing, and you got to watch yourself because it's the slick ones that, that are trouble, the ones that sound charming, and you gotta watch those guys. Those guys. <laughs> I remember Anne bringing that up. She was over at Elk Grove or something like mm -hmm. that, and it seemed that the more intelligent you were, the more people were suspicious of you, mm -hmm. that you were pulling something. And it's, <laughs> I, you know, I had That's to agree, I had to agree. I see, I see the impulse myself, mm -hmm. you know, I'd say, hey, slick, what are you pulling? <laughs> and how do, I thought in Occupy that that ought to be one of the goals to break break that down at least amongst ourselves. Mm -hmm. That um, without that, if we still distrust each other, if we all still think that we're playing numbers on each other and are, you know, doing kind of ego things of I'll play with him and you know, and then I look good and he looks bad and I, if we uh, are still dealing with each other on that level, then there's no way out out of this, you know. I don't think we'll just rehash the old problems again. And that's why I'm so reluctant to get into grievances. That's why I have the grievance group over there. For people who want to sit around and on and that's one, and I hate this and I hate that. They say, sorry, take it to the grievance group. We are going to talk about how we want it to be, how this community can become a healing therapeutic community ourselves. Including oh, wow. ourselves. A big, uh, big uh, vision is, is a, a therapeutic community. We're going to need a lot of that with a lot of people with skills. Well, it's kind of where I began. Working in psychiatry for 35 dang years. Oh, wow. It's a main. Did you get the microphone? Working the units. Same place they got the camera. And working with. The most troubled people in the world, all the ones. Just be more careful. Half of the people I dealt with had either tried to kill themselves <laughs> or were there because they were going to kill themselves. That the world sucked so badly that they they were really thinking that suicide is the only answer. And and my job was to somehow help them get their perspective back and see that there's joy amid the sorrow, that there's good and bad and it all goes together and and how you think about it and how you approach it has a lot to do with how it works out. And so we're teaching assertion training and um, self-esteem and uh, conflict resolution and you know the skills you need to deal with this crazy world and sometimes you succeed sometimes you don't but I've taken that same as attitude I I'm always on the unit I'm always I can't turn it off that's the one problem I left the profession but I'm still every time I see something that needs to be you know I my first impulse is to do something so I think that's a healthy healthy impulse I think I don't condemn myself for it I mean that's that's who I am but I think it comes across, I don't know how it comes across, patronizing in some ways, you know, like like I'm some superior being and I'm delivering the truth and the whatever, and people say, eh, fuck you, I, I don't need that. And, you know, and I'm going, okay, how can I not come across that way? Yeah, and awesome. to be fair, like, this is something, the listening skills we all need to learn, which I think was one of the things that I've... I've started to put words to more with with Tiffany's NVC trainings and stuff, you know, just being able to listen to people and, and saying like, oh, well, they're saying it in a way that may rub me a long way, but I can just, I can just ignore that part and look at the meat and, and you know, try to, you know, go so with it, it. It, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's like, 
dancing, you know, it's always two to tango. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. and yeah, when yeah. things get heated, it always took two. And, yeah, yeah. and it always takes two to resolve it and calm it down. So, so you know, don't, don't beat yourself up too much, you know. <laughs> and, and we're all learning. Yeah, all learning. yeah. And you can build relationships in a conflict. Sometimes you get closer to a person, you fight it exactly. out, and then afterwards you exactly. give them a big hug and say, yeah. yeah, I can dig it, Charlie. Yeah. It's that holding off and saying, I don't even trust you enough to, to deal with you mm -hmm. and to mm -hmm. tell you what my problem is. Mm -hmm. I don't even trust you that much. And so nothing ever gets resolved. Nothing yeah. ever gets yeah. And we hold on to all our resentments and mistrust. And maybe, you know, I realize that's very big order to want to change that. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost crazy, you know, fanciful, stupid. But I think that people in Occupy are of the type of people that have not on the unit. And we've all kind of like attracted each other because we've all been so hopeless for years probably <laughs> some of us decades <laughs> you know like going the world's going to hell in a handbasket I see nobody doing anything about it and nobody else seems to care all of a sudden Occupy happens man there's a lot of people out there that have concern about what's going on and they have a much better handle on it than I do and even some people who may don't really look like they've got it all together still have a lot to share it's a lot of value um, it's the fact that they're willing to be angry and seek out other people that tells me, oh yeah, that's what I need to do. I've been alone with this shit for so long, I don't want to be alone with it anymore. I don't know if they have the answers, but um, <laughs> but at least they're looking. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yes. And so that there's hope. I get big hope out of that. Woohoo! I'm not the only, I mean, it's like, it's, it's like, it's just like, like being on the, what did you call it again? The unit. <laughs> I'm going to have to try and incorporate that one more. Yeah, it's like being on the unit and uh, thinking you're the only one that's crazy. <laughs> and the rest of them really don't know how crazy it is. I still strongly get that feeling that there's a hunger in this country for community, for connection, for neighborhood feelings, for feeling that there's a group of people that that they know and they like and they get together with and they feel comfortable with and they say what happened to that why where is that what how do you find that what where you know you find it in a church community some but most churches I'm sorry yeah I'm sorry that's not where you're gonna find it <laughs> from my point of view but it's like what you're just saying there wouldn't it be nice to be able to sit down with somebody look them in the eye tell them what you really feel and they expect to get an honest answer back like what's happening right here this seems so wonderful to me and I can't understand why people aren't flocking to me. oh please let me join please let me play but I guess you know that's the mis disconnect I would just think I would want to be here if I saw this on the say, hey man let me let me in on that that looks like what I'm missing so I guess I'm gonna stop giving a flying leap on how many people show up until it gets down to zero. <laughs> when it's just me sitting in this chair, no one shows up, uh, that will be the final message that says, okay, you can go home now. <laughs> but until that point, I'm just going to keep on fighting. And I'm going to try and make sure, just have, maybe have some other people sit in this chair and I'll sit there so that it isn't, you know, too much cowbell. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> you go get a real cowboy. Cowboys are real. You were gonna do something on the cowboy. Oh, I don't know about the cowboy. <laughs> I thought I but heard I, you there. I was thinking about the um, after last Saturday, and and then um, cool. uh, I uh, um, I went to a, a hearing on Wednesday. Um, that has to do with Medi-Cal and with my program IHSS and, and there was somebody else there from, from Occupy and, and somebody else had quit because they'd gotten offended because of something he really wasn't aware of having doing, done and all that. And 
so David and I were talking, my son David and I were talking about it, and, and you know, we're all, we all come from, I mean, when you looked around the room, there was a large demographic going on, and, and that's what makes us strong, but it's also, we all come from different points of view, and everybody's, you know, we're going to find um, disagreements, and our egos are going to get involved in, in things, and I think we just have to, as a as a as a will point of will to say you know we're just not going to let ourselves get that bent out of shape and 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 David started listing all the things that we all agree on you know I think we all agree on you know yeah. how he just went down a long 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 list of things where where you know pretty much pretty much So that's all I want to say is, is um, you know, I think we just have to be careful not to let ourselves get alienated over somebody saying, you know, something that makes us feel cut off. Right. It's so hypersensitive, it's so... Well, you don't even have to be hypersensitive. I mean, you just... Because <laughs> even, you know, if somebody says something, my... You know, somebody says uh, something that I think is all wrong. My my instinct is to go, Ugh, you know, and um, and you know, just go. Well, yeah, okay. You know, that's. I don't want to go that direction. I think we have to stand up for some things. I, I mean, I feel very, very strongly about nonviolence. I think that is absolutely crucial and critical and basic. But. But a lot of other things are, are, you know, they really hit on your ego or, or just a different point of view and some people are kind of strong in the way they speak and, you know, might, might rub you the wrong way or something and we just have to go, yeah, well. Everybody seems to have the point of passion, you know, the thing that motivates them. And too often, it's like in conflict with somebody else's point of passion. They're saying, yeah, 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 I, I understand. But I want to tell you about my point of passion because it's what's really motivating me. And it almost ends up in a conflict. Like we're in conflict with how to do the right thing in Occupy, how to make a beautiful experience and a wonderful revolution in the world. And we're ending up having a lot of inner conflicts about saying, no, 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 you got it all wrong. So much so that we just drift into little compartments and, and little groups that support each other and maybe start looking at other people as not quite uh, going along with the program. And at least that's kind of what I see happening at times. And I think we have to go, you know, I think it's fine to have those arguments. I mean, I, the people I'm the closest to, we argue all the time about those things. We, you know, we reflect off of each other's opinions and, and, and you know, David and I talk on the phone and no, you're absolutely wrong about that. <laughs> I'm right. You're wrong. <laughs> but, but you know, obviously we all have to, um, you know, be able to operate together and just, you know, go forward with all the things. Because there are a lot of things where we're all together. Just, you know. But the original idea... But that I wor worried me. That worried yeah. me that people would, would leave. So I don't want people to leave over silly little things. Right. I'm sorry. No, I just forgot her present. <laughs> it started out as um, me trying to do the, the paradigm shift in uh, the American way of life or government. And to do that, you brainstorm. You put, put up a list, and you have everybody come up with every everything that's important to them. You have, 50 different ideas, and you don't uh, edit them. And that's something that we all, and then you kind of put those over here, and then you go through the list. What are the top five or 12 that we really feel strongly about? And you go through that list, and you, you kind of winnow it down to a dozen, the dirty dozen issues that everybody is strong with, everybody cares about, everybody is willing to fight for. And then you have something, you have a cohesive something that, that everybody's bought into. 
And that was the original idea for this group, is to start working on that, you know, getting a consensus on a, a dozen issues that were all really, and opening it up to a lot of issues that haven't been talked about. Making sure that every person who has a, a passion gets a chance to sell it, you know, to promote it. So that everybody feels that they were heard even though everybody's idea maybe didn't go onto the top of the list. I think I could accept that. Most people can accept that. But we couldn't even get to that because the first component was team building, community, learning to talk to each other, learning not to be s sensitive about directness, to be willing to play hardball with each other and tell the truth and say, you know, we're, we're grown-ups here. You know, we can confront each other and not fall apart and cry. And, you know, we just discuss it, work it out. We're, we're grown-ups. That's what democracy is all about. You learn to communicate. And, and that's all we've had time. We have, we've spent eight, eight hours over, four, over a month plus the five hours at the strategy forum, working pretty much on, on that, on building a community that's not a herd of cats all going in 5,000 different directions. And I don't think we found the way, and that's why I'm saying, well, at least this is a, it's an idea, you know, it's, there's a possibility that this might be useful if people would, you know, just kind of drag themselves down here. But without it, I don't. See. I'm sorry, Greg. I kind of agree with you that we didn't really find a solution at the strategy farm. And, you know, it's going to be a while before I think we do find the solution. But things like that, at least we were able to peaceably get amongst each other with all these varied ideas and opinions and discuss them a little bit. I mean, we might not have came to a, uh, a concrete solution on anything, but at least we got a lot of those issues out. People were able to speak their minds and why they feel certain ways about it. And, you know, that, that, that does have an impact on the way the individuals that previously didn't have that input now can see things. And now they get to see these other viewpoints rather than just, well, I'm over here doing what I'm doing and, you know, I'm thinking this and this and this and now I get to, you know, they didn't know what's going on because they were interacting with each other. It's like everybody's off on their autonomous this and autonomous that and then, you know. Plus I think the past two weeks have kind of at least got, got some awakeness back up. Like the first one wasn't necessarily the best, but it still got us back out there. Kind of got a little, got some attention back on us. And then Monday was just, dude. Yeah. If anybody said that did, can say that didn't go good, I don't know who they were. That was from <laughs> Democracy Now on Tuesday. Huh? Mm -hmm. yeah, they, I saw Democracy that. Now highlighted the, the action on Monday. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And I was able to live stream some of it, so that was, that was very nice, too. Because I was on the West Steps, so I got to see, I got to be right there for that. So. And, and when you get a thousand people together in a park, you know, kind of, that's a wonderful feeling of solidarity, but it's really not community building. It's not conflict resolution. From, it doesn't solve. Well, I think it's sort of a topic. I must put these uh, on my calendar. <laughs> things, things to do. <laughs> And, and, you know, the Monsanto thing, I want to do that, and, and uh, the SEIU thing, I want to do that. And so it, it, it gave me the, the ability to feel like when I, when I went home, I had some actions that I was going to be a participant in, you know. And, and, that, and that we all... Um, I think we all endorse those, even, you know, people aren't going to be able to make it. I wasn't able to make it to the thing on Monday. Everybody isn't going to be able to make it to everything, but we all endorse those things. And, yeah. and, and that's a big point of solidarity. I guess it's wanting to go further than that, than just to be a, a protest group, um, a grievance group, you know, that comes out and talks about the things that each individual issue and we show up and say we, we support this, we support this, we also support this, we also, we don't support this so much but we do some. 
And I, you know, you can't argue with that. That's a wonderful thing that that's happening. But I think that the Occupy concept can go further than that. And that what happened at, okay, I, I see you, I see you. That at Occupy Wall Street and Occupy DC and Occupy Oakland and Occupy, the place where they got together in the tents, they were stuck there 24-7 for days after day after day, working stuff out face to face, having all these people together, working through all the personal issues, all the individual stuff, all everything, you know, 24-7. They were doing that for six weeks. And at the end of it, you had a cohesive community that wasn't sitting around arguing with each other about yada yada. They could work together as a community. And I don't know exactly how it happened. But I think something happens when you get in the tents for six weeks and you create a, a bonded community, not just a, a 500 people with 500 different ideas and 500 different priorities, you know. And that was why I thought we need to go to the tents, why we should have Occupy a Farm, why we should get the tents out there and stay overnight with each other and even if it's only a couple of nights, but get out in the tents and start bonding and community building and st team building and all the messy stuff that we've just skipped and we type messages to each other and call and but there's something missing you know the okay I'm sorry you know you you I wish you would, nice and loud, real loud so everybody can hear. Belt it out. A lot of people don't really know what Occupy is about. Well, it's ba well, it is basically a movement who are trying to change the world. The people who don't know what Occupy is about probably haven't been here. So give it a try. We won't make fun of you. Help us out. Ask yourself, do you like the 1% stealing your job and your home? It all starts with you and a little movement to change the world. And then there's a picture of the world. Amen. That was that's better the second time. <laughs> I love that. We all love that. And it's so true. I just wanted to say, um, I, I do agree with you on the, the being closer together kind of helps people cooperate better because kind of like even over here, the ones of us that have been here for a period of time, like we get the rough spots when the new people are coming in, you, you have to take a little bit of time to learn who this new person is, but more and more as we are over there, we learn how to cooperate with each other better as we're going through the trials and tribulations and dealing with it because I think that is a major, had a major role to play out there is they had the trials and tribulations while they were there. So they weren't just like, okay, we're trying to fix this, but we're not doing the same thing in the process, you know, we're not fighting the same fights at the same time, you know, because that, that, that fighting together brings that camaraderie, kind of like uh, soldiers at war, you know, they they might have somebody they completely hate, you know, sometimes you've got a racist in the same platoon as a black guy, and by the end of it, they're still brothers in arms, and they still respect each other and work together, you know, uh, and like the strategy for them, I think, is a that we were doing, I think that did a lot of work towards it. If we were able to have more of those more frequently, you know, that, because there we can get together, hash out our issues, you know, we're actually putting them out there on the table, not just like a one small group of us, but a large chunk of who's still here is there to get these issues out. And that, that helps a lot, because even though we're, the idea is to get some planning done, in the process of that, you got to learn to cooperate with each other in a productive fashion. So, yeah, I think that a group like this is almost the only place that that would happen. There are two minutes, and I say, you got two minutes to say what you want to say, get on the track and get out of here. <laughs> There's not going to be a whole lot of bonding and at least here, you get to say what you want to say and back and forth, and you know. You can get beneath the just the superficial, and if you feel you're not being listened to, you say, "Hey, you didn't hear me at all. I'm saying this, not that." And that wouldn't work, in you know, it only works in a thing like this, this open-ended kind of. Let's just get together and and rip, and and stop being so polite and careful around each other, and just 
you know, be real, just be real. And see if we can handle it. See if we can... Um, I know Occupy has not just this Occupy, but a lot of other Occupies and everything have taken over big buildings. They've done a lot of stuff that maybe they that maybe they shouldn't have done or they should should have done. And um, a lot of people, like my dad, think that they just get it off the gate to get Occupy out of the, out of the park. And, well, I was playing a kickback with this kid. I accidentally kicked it over the gate. And we found a way to get in the gate. They've so, opened up a bunch of it, I just now noticed. Yeah, it looks yeah, a lot more open. There's an opening in the gate where, like, those poles are and that tractor is. So, um, yeah, that's all I have to say. <laughs> you would like to have an action in the park? Uh -huh. I wanted to share, um, in November I went to a conference in, in L.A. Um, on drug policy reform. And I spent, uh, one of my good friends from Drug Policy, I've known over the years, was from LA, and he was like, friends with the Occupy there. And so he took us there, and we hung out for a couple hours, like, like at nine or so at night. So it wasn't, it was like, it was definitely like the community time. And like, you know, they, they had this beautiful mural, you know, where the, like the city had boarded up all the, like this fountain, and, and on the boarding, you know, they just made this beautiful mural that was like political, it was like the octopus, and like the, the eye, and everything, you know, and uh, there was music, and there was the first aid tent, and the kitchen, and you know, it was just very, it was huge, and it was organized, and and then I sat in a little discussion of people talking about the wording on this flyer that they wanted to print, you know, so it was the full range. I'm really, like, I, I really am, I'm not really one to do teaching too often, but I like to stop and listen to a little bit of what's going on sometimes, and I like to be involved, because that way I can stay educated. I just got a short attention span, so I tend to want to move around a lot. But uh, I agreed when we had all those teach-ins and stuff. Like, even though I like to move around a lot because my ADHD, there was something happening. You know, it's like, hey, I'm kind of bored of just sitting over here waiting for the next action or waiting to find out what's going on with this. So I'm gonna go over here and do this. I'm tired of passing out flyers. I've been doing that for the past three days. Hey, let me go sit in for a teaching for a little bit. Let me go see what's going on over here with this with this group. You know, they, they look like they're doing something interesting. Let's go talk to these people. And now it's just kind of like, you don't really see as many people very often. Like, normally the only time you really see any of the people out here is GA. You know, it's like, yay, finally there's somebody here that's not supposed to be occupying with us. Yay, you know? Like, a lot of that was the winter video. That, that's hard on morale for a lot of the people that are like, you know what, there's a lot of people that are working, they can't be out here, but can they at least come show their face so we know who they are? <laughs> Type thing, you know? It's, and we get we get some of the people that come out here on a pretty regular basis. We, we get so much support just from the neighborhood sometimes. And, you know, it feels good. I, I'd love to see us all back out here again on a regular basis like that. Because that, that was what was bringing community in. Like, even after the big blow up with the uh, original outreach. You know, people still, new people still did come in. We lost some people, but we were still getting a good amount of people coming through. People were still getting educated. And like when I'm out in the neighborhood now, especially after Monday, the reaction is like people are actually interested in going in and, and knowing what's going on. Like especially with these Monsanto flyers. Like I'll, I'll go to start passing them out. People get are like, I'm on it. Or like, people will look at me and start to say no, and then I'll start saying something about, we're going to be occupying Monsanto. They're like, occupy? Oh, yeah, what's Monsanto? You know, and the, the reaction is changing for the better. Honestly, all we need to do is come together back where we were supposed to, where we were supposed to be at, and make sure they know we're here, and pretty it's, sure people will come out. It's kind of like the Ark, you build it. Yeah, it's, and that's what this group is supposed to be looking for, the how. How do you get people back with the enthusiasm and the caring and the whatever. Part, you know, part of it is that I do not want to be localized in this park for the rest of Occupy. We're occupying this park for a reason, which is to draw people together so that we would spread the message outwards. Not ask everybody in Sacramento to come here, because that's unrealistic. We have to be able to go out and spread the word, as it were, to occupy a park, to occupy 
you know, um, I don't know, a farm to occupy something where we can invite people to participate. Oh, I was thinking of if we had a bus, we put 50 people on, we go to Arden Fair Mall, we show up at 10 o'clock in the morning, we do a people's chant that says, for everyone who wants to know what Occupy is about, we're here. Don't listen to Fox, don't listen to CNN, don't come talk to us. We'll be here for four hours and we're gonna have a GA at four o'clock. You can participate and you can find out what Occupy is all about. And then we could make a, we could be doing that, taking the Occupy out into the world around us and giving the people a chance to participate in it, which is the real genius of Occupy, is when they found out, oh gee, you mean I get to talk? You mean you want me to participate, really? Not just look? And I think people would say, oh, I think I'm think i beginning to see what Occupy is about. It's not about putting graffiti on windows or punching policemen or something. <laughs> There's a thing happening here that I kind of, that sense of community, you know, that sense of, not belonging to anybody, being cut off, no neighborhoods, no, all everybody isolated in their own little separate world. Everybody's looking for something <laughs> to get out of that. And if we're offering, I think there'll be a lot of people listening. Well, but was, right now we're kind of so constricted into yeah. this little area. I was really pleased with the reaction you got when you brought up the bus idea <laughs> at the strategy forum. Yes. Because I, I really, I like that idea a lot. I think it's, it's so logistically useful. It, and it's and it's visually useful, and it, you know, it, and like like you sort of name this this uh, this sessions we do these sessions we do here as like a 60 style 60 style teaching, like that helps. That's like a good symbol. Like, I, I'm assuming like there's no bus in my mind that wasn't painted up. <laughs> yes, right. You know, like a beautifully, <laughs> but but that like that helps connect the dots for people. I think, and it helps. Um, and, and then, yeah, logistically, that, that could really get us a, a lot done. Because uh, that's one thing in the beginning I was thinking about when we still had a whole bunch of people is mm -hmm. why don't we get a party bus and go pick people up from the neighborhood and get down here to get them involved with us. You know, because, like, me, I, I try to get involved with each and every person I talk to down the street, up and down. People that know me are actually getting tired of hearing me talking about Occupy when I'm not here. Because that... Well, like we were doing in the very beginning, it said, eat, sleep, occupy. And, you know, to me that meant, you know, we do everything we can for the movement. When we're out talking to people, we'd make sure we slip something in about occupy to them. we try to give them a little bit of knowledge on what we're out here doing. Uh, maybe not know every detail of any, every little thing, but, you know, know enough to be able to spark their interest. You know, if I find a topic that is occupy related that each individual we're kind of like, hey, wait, you know, I, I am concerned about that, and it helps a lot. Like, there's there's a whole bunch of people out here that they're just waiting for the right time. Honestly. Have you been any argument almost from anybody in Occupy about that? Yeah. It's all about the how, all about the just how talking. many and how much. Hey, how, how many of you? How do you excite the population? For instance. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not too new to the town. Who here is a, an uphill goes out battle, to a restaurant. it seems, but. <laughs> Who here actually goes out to a restaurant at least like once a week, right? About an average for people, right? Go eat out once a week, whether it's fast food or whatever, right? You could be talking to the person behind the counter about Occupy. Be like, oh man, we just had this really great action the other day, you know? We went out there, we, we protested for the da 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 da. And you know, they're like, oh wait, now I'm putting a face that was there and I'm talking to them and if you're if we're a personable people people will start getting interested in your conversation period but you gotta you, 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 uh, yeah, that's what I do a lot it's selling Occupy on selling Occupy <laughs> yep and if everybody were exactly like you we wouldn't have a problem because you're here 24-7 you're com totally committed you're here 100% of the time you are in the sweet spot of Occupy but everybody else is living this other kind of life. The drop-in. Dual life. The drop-in life. The dual life. When I, when I talk to folks about it, if the word occupied because there's not a lot of understanding about what it means. Um, no, wait. Um, a lot of folks, they'll get... They'll get wrapped up 
mixed up with the name too much and miss the point. So if that ends up happening, I don't even talk about Occupy, I don't use that word so much. Then it, it gets more into branding. Mm. And I worry about mm -hmm. focusing more on the branding and where the name came from rather than the principles behind it. Mm. And usually when we get past that and just get into the idea, the gist of what we're talking about, then, you know, it's like, well, don't worry about that, but let's just talk about where you are and why to get foreclosed and, and who's having the experiments done on them without proper FDA approval and, you know, all kinds of things that are going on that people are finding a way to now have a dialogue about. Nobody's asleep anymore. And in that, I think there's a lot of people and there's actually a lot of excitement still in Sacramento. So it's not that people aren't excited about the ideas. They just don't want to get wrapped up in the branding because that's what makes it to the new. The short, sweet, oh, if I say Occupy, everybody knows what that means. And there's a plus sign or a negative sign next to that on the news for those 15 second spots. But talking about things and ideas seems to always go over really well. Corporations and the the people that are running them and all these bankers and all that. It's about also educating the people so that they can be aware of what's going on. And in a way, it is a form of occupation because we are occupying their minds with the information and the fact that we have them talking. That we've changed the national dialogue. Like you listen to the news and to the TV now, and people are actually talking about the actual issues, not just the politicians. Like. A lot of the people that are actually paying attention to what they were saying during the uh, little Republicans, seeing who's going for president, they weren't even saying nothing about the issues, and everybody noticed it. They're like, wait a minute. But, you know, they're not saying anything about these. The whole conversations are, oh, I think I, I think we're going to have a... Uh, yeah, I, I think you were saying that earlier. Somebody was earlier. And the fact that we've done that shows that we've already made a big step towards our goal. It's just... I thought... Some guy, I think it Occupy uh, DC, was saying there's a faction there that wants to abandon the Occupy name itself. We're no longer occupying. We need to rebrand ourselves. But to your point, if we're a movement, we kind of have to have an identity. But somehow, I mean, you can't sell ice cream without a name on it or something. I. And if it's if we're just a, a lot of people who have a lot of different things that they care about and a lot of different interests, I don't know how you, how that grows other than you know hope kind of hopeful that I see us somehow having a penetrating message that cuts through. Uh, all the stuff and kind of gets down to the heart and people go, oh yeah, I see. Oh, oh, of course, yeah. And I worry about the way that we are divided up into 500 separate issues, kind of searching for a central purpose. I and think we have a central purpose. But, uh, and I'm not, I'm, I have my anxieties about Occupy, but it's not that we haven't sort of all congealed, you know. That's that is not one of my anxieties at all. I think it, as long as we're, as long as everybody shows up and keeps going forward, and we keep doing actions. I mean, again, I'm thinking it. You know, I can't help it. It's the way I am. I think in concrete terms, sort of. Um, I I think you know all of that will will work itself out um, as long as we don't get. Um, uh, you know, into, you know, like I was saying before, um, well, I'm, you know, I don't feel, I, I don't like this person's... And everybody I ask gives me a different answer. And that's their impression of Occupy is that everybody has a different answer, that Occupy isn't really anything. It's a lot of people call themselves Occupy that don't agree about anything. Well, we have that, that um, on the flyer out of my car and really read it, but I love it. I love every word of it. I really like that phrase you just used, the healthy society. That's a nice 
general term for a goal, you know, like our, our, our collective goal, I feel. In order to have a healthy society, we must have an educated society, because mm -hmm. that, that, that's the top priority of anything, in my, in my opinion. Isn't it? Not only do you cut down on violence, not only do you cut down on accidents and unnecessary injuries and ignorance, you, you also create a society that is aware of the things they need in order to keep themselves healthy and active, which leads to the capability of creating better jobs, more jobs, and everything kind of just trickles down from education. Um, which, by the way, I just wanted to let everybody know, Jared just got us the uh, information tables back. Oh, wow. So awesome, all we need now is uh, somebody to bring in and take it at night. <laughs> Until we have storage. So... Well, I see, somehow I can see occupying as the lead progressive yeah. wing. <laughs> you got a fan, Miles. It's kind of, we're the, the only progressive wing in America. That the the um, conservative tilt has just kind of swallowed up America, and we're a, you know, like they say, a, a center right nation. Well, that doesn't that doesn't have a left wing. It doesn't have a progressive wing. It doesn't have it's single party, whatever it is. <laughs> and Democrats and Republicans are so close to being the same thing. Yeah, yeah. The progressive says we don't want any part of. I mean, Occupy says we don't want any part of either of them because they're both too damn conservative. They're both stuck in the same old paradigms, the old things that never work. They're still playing the same money games. They're still playing all the same things. They're just two different styles of the same. And we want something different than that. We want a progressive option to that. And progressive, we have to define what the progressive option is. Some, when somebody says, well, what is the progressive option? We kind of have to have an answer. And I think we can develop one. At least that's my hope, is that we could develop a con cohesive, shared understanding of what the progressive option is and what we're selling to America. We're saying, this is the progressive option. You know what the conservative option, you've been living it for 30, 40, 50 years. This is what we're suggesting. To try and move the country in a more progressive direction. Now, I don't know if that's possible even. But it, it seems to be what we're trying to do. At least we're that, you know, we are progressives, right? I mean, we are for... Depends on the definition, but... <laughs> there's, there's a lot of... There's a lot what do you call the people yeah. on the other side of the yeah. political spectrum from right-wing conservatives and Tea Partiers? We're not them, I hope. Well, well no, we're, that's the point, yeah. though. Who is we if you're not including everyone? I don't include white supremacists in my group. Well, guess what? I invite them to join, but I don't. Then, then who is we? Then it's really a us and them rather than we. Well, you're saying there's no right and no wrong. Everything is equally valid. I like valid. we're healthy. Hmm? I like we're healthy. You usually do stay away from the word right. Has anything that has true analysis underneath it rather than just stopping at our fear? When we really, really analyze things like that, we're going to find the truth and therefore some more compassion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. towards. And then suddenly they're not an us and them anymore, then they're part of the Not unless they want to be. I mean, white supremacists are difficult to talk to and difficult to persuade. Not saying it's not hard, but... And... I'm not going to sit and argue white supremacy issues. Thank you. Because they feel it's legitimate. But that's, I'm not that's gonna argue, an extreme example. Maybe we should go back to pre-Civil War times and return to slavery. Somebody may think that's a legitimate idea. I say that's madness and it's not even reasonable to be discussing or at least discuss it in your group over there of white supremacists but it's not what we're talking about and, and if we can't be exclusive to the point we say it, do you want to be part of this or are you something you find incompatible people there's a lot of people who say occupies the last thing I'd want to have anything to do with because they're all socialists they're all Hippies, they're all, you know, we've already rejected that. That yeah, well, we're we don't want to do that anymore.
Well, I don't know. I think we have to it's define ourselves. Fun. We can't just be it everything. Very, very we can't just be everything. everything. I don't think that it can be solved in a couple afternoons. And I think that's the point. I'm certainly not proposing that. But but looking at it, like if that's something that brings up resistance, some of my teachers would say, "Oh, but that's that's interesting because it's it's really cool to sit around and go, what do we agree about?" But then to like really look at and be interested by, curious by, intrigued by the things that divide us. Okay. I'm interested in that too. I get angry and resentful, but actually become more like, hmm, this is interesting. Where did this happen? Why did this happen? Let's go back to the beginning. Let's remember. Let's try to remember what we weren't taught and try to go back, 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 back. And maybe fix the original wrong, the original division that created such a thing as classism, genderism, racism. Okay, okay. And do you want us. How do you spread those ideas so that they're effective in large... That a lot of people agree with that and a lot of people want to act on that. So a lot of people can start discussing it? I mean, how do you get to the point where it's not just you and a small group of friends talking about these very intellectual subjects and it's a people's movement that sweeps across America and the world? I feel like... I mean, part of it's a generational thing. I think they're like 30 and under, especially 20 and under. A lot of these isms meet like, there's a lot, there's just so much less of it. And, and so I think there is like a groundswell that's like just demographic, natural progression of, of our, our melting pot of a country. That, that we're, if, if left alone, we'll grow out of it anyway. But it's just a matter of time and these, these general, generational issues that, that it is tough. And, and these are the tough conversations to have, you know. And when, when I get to the, that extreme end of, of you know, white, white, white supremacists or something, if I were to interact with, with them, you know, more than anything, I just feel like pity and empathy mm -hmm. just for the amount of hate that runs their lives, you know. It's a horrible way to live. And, and so trying to, if nothing else, that's like my starting point for trying to trying to bridge a gap. Like, wow, you are you just have a painful life because of this. How how can we get through this? You know, so, so somewhere to keep it from being a war, a culture war. Yeah, yeah. Us against the yeah, trying, trying to get to good that good guys, bad guys, progressives. You know? Well, uh, those, uh, I yeah, I agree with you, and I and and those. Uh, those, uh, you know, racism and those things are, are always um, employed. And that's one thing where Occupy has really, I think, been a part of breaking down some of those things, just making people aware. Um, you know, if, if we, the powerful, can keep you, the not-so-powerful, fighting with each other over crumbs, then, you know, we, we get to break in all the money and you guys uh, down there will, will struggle over whatever and, you know, keep on fighting because it works for us and, and yeah. <laughs> we need to start focusing on how we, we share slices of pie instead of just the crumbs. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> to jump back a little bit, when, you were, when we first sat down it was just uh, David, uh, David, I. Um, he, was, he was expressing concern about the numbers and and the participation, and and I wanted to um, just point out that most of our marches and stuff, like most of our direct actions, which we really should like, that should be our, our you know theoretically our, our most important part. Like they're they're getting minimal participation, and, and it's been an uphill battle these last couple months. So it's you know. All, all the strategies are, are, are thin right now. Is that is that so really? Yeah, I mean, all, 
Because everything I hear about that I'm able to do on the weekends, I can Well, there's show. been a little, in the last few weeks especially, there's uh, more of our events have been more coalition building, where we're not just doing an event as Occupy Sacramento, but we're working with others. And, and they, you know, like the foreclosure event last week, there were like 10 people from Occupy Sacramento and 50 people from the Bay Area, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> which was just sort of ridiculous. But it, it, so overall, it was a good event. But Occupy Sacramento was not representing, you know, they were, we weren't holding it down. Um, so so it's, it's a common problem that, that we haven't, you know, I, again, I think it's, it's part of that, that natural uh, waffling, or what's, what's it called? The sine wave. Yeah, it's yeah. Natural progression, human events. Winter happens, people assume everything's like quieter and worry about it less, maybe focus on whatever their lives were outside of this before Occupy started that they've been rejecting for the last two months. <laughs> All well, these processes. It sounds like we're having a dispute over whether we want to be a political force. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's open for discussion, As I, but I think we already are, that we've in a way already made the decision we are a political force, we're influencing the politics of America already and we haven't even been alive for more than five months. So the question is, what kind of political force are we? What do we want to say to this nation? Is there, is there anything we have to say to this nation? Can it be coherent? Can it be something other than every person you talk to should be? That we should not have a political. No, I'm not saying we that don't that. need I don't to I've agree said with that. things. I've never said that. Oh, okay. Well, that, that's what it feels like. Yeah, here. I've never said that. But I, it is. If I could articulate, um, if I'm hearing you right, what you're looking for is where's the common ground? Yeah. What's the one thing that everybody nods their head to? One principle. Or at least a handful of them. Yeah. Yeah. Is it a question that's ever been asked? It's kind of what this is was trying to do. <laughs> but the one, the one thing that everybody is and then organize around that. Well, I think we are at one percent, ninety-nine percent is probably the, the most encapsulating of all the, the phrases and thoughts that have come out and the one that immediately made an impression on the whole society. They say, we get it. You just can't have one percent of the population have all the money, all the power, all the influence, all everything, and the ninety-nine percent spread, take, pick through the rest. That's, that's just crazy. That's common sense. It's crazy. And we've kind of gone from there. Therefore, if once you believe that, then there's a cascade of things, of removing that 1% from that position of total power over everybody else, and re-empowering the 99% so they feel that it's their country again. It doesn't, it's not owned by gazillionaires and bazillionaires. And, you know, I don't think we've gotten any further than that. That's probably the only thing we really all agree on. And then we have a lot of movements, you know, and... Well, I, I don't know well, I need you know, to be. Oh, you can, okay, so as you just described the 99% slogan, I think that that got co-opted and, and distorted because when I first heard it, um, I heard it as a message of, hey, wake up. We're all getting screwed. And it's, it's by this system, it's by this um, power structure, it's by the politics as usual, the money in Congress, everything's lost control. It's about waking up to all of the things that have gotten distorted. So for me, that's what Occupy's about. It's waking up. I mean, if you were to say one thing about Occupy, it's about waking up Wake to up. a whole bunch of things that are all screwed up. And because there's so many things messed up, and we all have our own little windows on certain aspects. You know, some people it's ecology, some people it's economics, some people are really aware how messed up the war is. Uh, and so, and we all get together and go, wow, we all agree. It's all those and it's things. all being kind of created by the same mess, by the same fundamental kind of 
out of control, nobody wants to speak to it kind of piece, which is, you could say it is, yeah, there's this 1% in charge and they have way too much money, but I don't think I, don't think I identify it that way. I, I, it feels like it feels like it's a big secret and we've all kind of been colluded or co-opted into this idea that that's the way it's got to be. Yeah, yeah. So we've given up, the 99% has given up having any say or any um, uh, awareness of being this such a large mass of people being screwed. Yeah. <laughs> Repeatedly, over and over again. And so, but the problem I've seen is, I've seen this emphasis on uh, redistribution of wealth. And, and that tends to bring in uh, an old uh, line of socialism and, and, uh -huh. and a bunch of things that then the right wing starts pointing at those folks and going, oh, there's the communists again. That's right. There's the socialists again. All those liberals, that's them again. We know what their message is. And so they're easily dismissing us because they think they have the message. It's worked every time. But before. it isn't really the message that I think it's occupies about. Even in fact, my, nef my definition of us getting all screwed includes the right wing. All those poor people oh, yeah. that are that have been kept ignorant, they're being preached to all the time about what they should believe and what's moral and what's ethical. And, oh, I mean, they're being controlled. But I think uh, in Occupy, we've woken up to, uh-oh, we've been controlled and we've been listening too much to... To what? To old to corporate, corporate, corporate media, media <laughs> right? And and it's like, whoa! It's going to take a while to recover from all those lies. I mean, this has been a con job. Oh, absolutely. And so those of us that that, that are willing to show up here realize that this is almost the only way to wake up from a con job, which I think was what we started this whole conversation about, which was what what, what were we talking in the very beginning? It was about getting together and getting some sense of hope. That I'm not the only one that sees this game going on. Yet, when I come to this whole group of people, and I and I start hearing other people's stories about how many other ways we're getting conned, it starts to get overwhelming. Like, oh man, it's Paralyzed. more screwed up than I thought. Paralyzed. Yeah, but people in that paralysis, we don't have that paralysis. We got a bunch yeah, of people yeah. that are so angry, they're making actions. They're oh, how you doing? <laughs> I'm glad I'm in the shade, otherwise this would be completely in the sun. <laughs> yeah, who knows how that's I am the sun, by the way. <laughs> the Father, the Holy Ghost, and everything else. Anyway, um, now I'm really conscious that I'm being photographed by this big well, old I, lens at me. I just wanted one, one statistic that, that screams out at me every time I hear it. The one about how f the 400 wealthiest people in this country control as much wealth as the bottom 150 million people. As much wealth, 400 people, as much as you can put in this park here, have, control as much wealth as the bottom half of the population of this country. 150 million people. Yeah. And they're saying, and that's the way it ought to be. Well, how did they get that way? Because we let it happen. Well, well but it, it was happening slowly. And it, if we do not say that must be corrected, not just that's bad and I hope it goes away, but that must be corrected and there must be a strategy and a direction that takes us to a place where that's no longer true. Because that 400 individuals can virtually buy and sell the government, the corporations and everything else in this country. And they look down upon us and say, and what are you going to do about it? Because I can buy and sell you and all your friends and everybody you ever knew, and there's nothing you can do about it. And we're talking about raising the consciousness of the American people to the point of saying, we won't put up with that anymore. I don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to do something. Okay, yeah. Well, can I say something? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I, like, about the whole finding common ground thing, I, I don't think that, um, that everybody in Occupy is going to really be able to find anything other than we're all getting screwed. But real, what I really think is just such an epic win about Occupy is that like we've got 
we've got everybody's attention like we're not being silenced anymore and people can hear our our grievances and our suggestions and stuff because the media reporters will come the second that they hear ooh occupy rally um but i think like a good direction to take it would be like to have some sort of news station or like newspaper something and have people like real people or like representatives of like different parties or activist groups or whatever put out their arguments and their suggestions on a on a open forum and um, like they wouldn't be specifically endorsed by Occupy in general. Occupy would just be like the vehicle to finally give real free speech to the forum. forum. Yeah. Oh, excellent. And I think we are, I, we're kind of are that, you know. We are the forum for a lot of people who don't have a chance and have never had a chance to speak. They can walk up, walk up to Jay, walk up to this group and say, well, let me tell you what I think. And we welcome that. Probably more than any group they'll ever run into. <laughs> Just like, like you. And that the fluffy doggy. Works. We lured you we in. We need with more the dogs. Poodle. That's what we, we need. Dogs. We get That's more dogs. It. More yes, dogs. just get we more. We know what our strategy uh, is. Get more yeah, cute fluffy doggies. Dogs. Yes. <laughs> Dog power. <laughs> now we're talking. That'll always bring me over. <laughs> Somebody's got a little dog. I love it. Actually, there's. Um, I brought this newspaper to your point. It's back in the publication called Homeward, and it's a dollar mm -hmm. donation. And I was gonna look at it and wonder if anybody here in the strategy session had become aware that probably with a nominal fee, somebody's somebody's voluntarily printing this. Mm -hmm. And it's to anybody who like gives a dollar and anyway, so I'm giving it as an example. Yeah, that is a wonderful thing what they do. That is. And then uh, I brought this because it doesn't talk about griping, it talks about what could be. And I don't remember anything in here, I haven't spent a while since I read it, anything in here about the value and let's value money. So the problem with the strategy of the whole idea of redistribution is it assumes that we're going to continue to value money as much as those 400 people. And that somehow by redistributing it, we've solved that problem, which is the overvaluation of money and possession of power and all that. But what would happen if we just didn't care? Well, I say that I couldn't buy people anymore. And suddenly the, having that much money, it loses its power. Because people would actually be focused more on, on this and focused on how to raise a child with compassion and how to, how to treat each other. And suddenly that would be more valuable. Or, you know, the whole idea of distribution of money, it's, money is just supposed to be a, a value of energy exchange. exchange. If I bake bread for you, your chickens grow eggs for me and then we're all somehow helping you that way. How it got to be the point where somebody could suddenly be But it can be a source of oppression. That much yeah. money controlled by those few individuals, and in, in that can be, power. it has been a source of oppression. And to just say, we, we shouldn't pay attention to that, and we should refocus ourselves on kind of more spiritual, and I, don't, I think you have to get that out of the way before we can move to being a more spiritual and more grounded and a more honest and more real country. I think we're, we are being oppressed and paralyzed by those people who want it one way and one way only and have no desire to spread the education of Khalil Gibran across the world. That's the last thing on their mind. They want to be able to continue to control and oppress the American people just as they have for the last however many years. And I think I don't. Well, it's life or death for a lot of people. I
of reso it's resources. If you just forget about the word money and look at the allocation of resources. And, and you know, I'm kind of incredulous still to hear people, you know, acting as though it's the people on Social Security or the people who are receiving Medi-Cal who caused the financial problems and therefore ought to be suffering and having everything, everything taken away from them and, and put in a position where their, their lives are much less likely to continue, you know. Um, and that, I, you know, I, I see that every day at work, and it, and it, you know, um, it's, you know, the, I, I have not, I, I keep meaning to read Naomi Klein's book, The Shock Doctrine, but I, I think we're in. And all they're concerned about is their own well-being and the well-being of the people they care about. And they really don't care about other people's welfare. They've lost that. They're not that. aware. They, they have no, I think, and, I, and there may be people who are compassionate but have somehow been able to just kind of forget that the people, because they really don't have an understanding. They, they, I mean, you can tell by some of the things they promulgate. They have no idea what people's needs are who are on, like my program's IHSS. They don't know what people need. They, they just don't, they have never been in that world never been in that world, they have no frame of reference to, to say, oh, you know, they, they, they can't go out and buy a good car. They can't, you know. Well, don't you get the feeling that some of them don't want to know? I think some they're, of them They're don't willfully want to blind, know. kind of saying, oh, I don't see yeah. that. That's, I, that's well, not an issue. We're rationalizing, me. too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like, a lot of it that seems to be throughout our country's history is like the the ruling class seems to take like a pride and a responsibility, a burden almost, saying like, well these idiots, we have to legislate for them, we have to take care of them, and, and you know, it seems like there's a lot of that kind of justification also in the in the world of making money for money's sake. Oh yeah, we're gonna make a lot of money, but we're always gonna put people in subprime homes and all this kind of shit. So, I mean, that's, like, in, in some ways, I, I don't even like to assume, I, I do think it's, it's like some kind of sickness where it's like your priorities are just warped. But they still seem to, at least like some subset of these, these 1% or 0.1% do seem to rationalize it, think they're, think they're doing something for a greater good, even if we beg to differ. Uh, <laughs> or, or how convenient you've convinced yourself yeah. of that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's something humans are great at. Like, our subconscious makes some decisions like, how can we justify this? <laughs> Self-delusion. <laughs> it's be an interesting survey to find out who are those 400 people and ask them, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, what is their current view of the world? Mm. What's their view of an ideal world? Like, what is utopian? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would they actually say, yeah, I'd really like it if there was no idea I mean. Maybe they would answer and say, I wish there was no sickness. What would they say? And what would be their answers? Because, you know, just like all of us, we're all born into a family and therefore into a culture that if no one's ever actually challenged their worldview, they just keep going on and, and there's a whole industry to make sure that people stay in those positions. I, think I believe that, right that, that Anne Rand you know, Ayn Rand, however you pronounce that, there's a lot of people who really believe that. Who really believe that idea of those people who merit and gather wealth are doing so because they deserve it and that it should be that way and the poor and the impoverished are exactly where they should be and this is the way society should be. The great should be exalted and the, the poor should just be Ignore because they chose not to be one of the exalted, yeah. and they believe this stuff, and they fight efforts to, for equality that says, no, I think we ought to spread it out a little more, and so that not just the great have fabulous wealth, but we all have enough. And they say, oh, that's com that's communism. That is what we are fighting against. Most we will not allow that to happen. The great must maintain their power and their wealth because that's. That's what's made this world great, is us, the great, the, the wealthy and the powerful. They believe that. They believe it passionately. And they're willing to sacrifice us for their beliefs. And that's 
why I feel Occupy is uh, has a an anger to it, a kind of no, you don't, no, you can't, you, oh, you, no, you can't, didn't. no, you <laughs> didn't, you cannot. <laughs> We're not buying that anymore. I don't know who ever did, but we don't believe that anymore. We're not buying. And even though we don't have a clear idea of what we want, we sure as heck know we don't want that. But the, the story you just said about the beliefs of the 400 is the story they're going to stay with. Because the real game is they control the government and they write the laws, they write the tax laws. They, it's a game beyond the game. It's their world. And they right? know it. And we've woken up to it, but the mainstream hasn't woken up to the fact that there really aren't any rules. They keep making them up as they go. That's what keeps them in control. And, th and that's what's so unfair about it, so, so, you know, so screwed up. Frustrating. And, you know, we've got people over in Iraq uh, fighting for democracy when we don't even have democracy here. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's a farce. The whole thing's a big mess. They really want this? Well, <laughs> but the Iraq story exactly keeps working because it's a simplistic story. It, it, it sells to the mid mainstream people. It, it, sells to the, it certainly sells to the right-wingers. But it's starting to break down, right? It's breaking down even it's at the right down. wing. And, and I think this and is a place where I go do. right over this whole schmear and I go, there are people on the right, way off on the right, that we probably would agree with. Oh, yeah. And we need to be reaching out to everybody, because I think I heard, you know, even the the fascist or even the white supremacist, you know, some of them are not stupid. Some of them see some of the game that's going on, well, and I'm to give we're being a a, we're being allowed to be kept separate from some groups who we could be naturally allied with. So here he's got this camera on me again. He just <laughs> goes away, so I don't even know I'm being photographed. <laughs> well, I think I have I a certain, certain a limit chance. to my ability to be on camera. <laughs> this everybody gets a chance, I think, to express themselves. But I don't have to buy everything that everybody's selling. And if somebody says, what you're saying is totally wrong, I'm not buying, you are a communist, and then I say, okay, I hear what you're saying, but we really don't need you to be in the part of this group because we're a bunch of communists here and we, we want to <laughs> talk about communism so you go join the tea party or whatever there's plenty of people who believe just exactly as you do if you'd like to join us and get a different point of view please please i welcome you to join us well but i would but say that we have we the are same not going to view as turn the, yeah. hmm? or we need we to, to focus on the bridge instead of like choosing one or the other dividing you know, yeah. we, we have to figure out where the bridge is, where we agree. Where do we agree? Because we agree... Okay, yes, yes. And yeah. you have to acknowledge that sometimes there is no point of agreement. There's some point? I can't There's sometimes no point of agreement. There are people who will not give in, people who will... Uh, we could put Rush Limbaugh right here, and I doubt we could talk him down and get him to accept where he'd say, Oh, you know, now that, you, now that, I, now that you've told me, Morgan, I've never heard it that way. I think I'm going to become a more progressive thinker. He is cast in cement. It, it would be a miracle if that happened. It might, but it would be a miracle. First of all, he wouldn't sit here with us for more than 20 seconds. But if he did, he would bluster and pr talk about his talking points and. But if we focused on the right issue, we'd say, you know, okay, we might be able to, we gave like money out of politics. Like why? How can you disagree with that? But that's that's a good point. Yeah. I'd I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it. I'd like it's to get some it's of the people you know? who are so a antagonistic towards Occupy to sit down with us and explain why and explain their positions. We're we are very inclusive. I, if it sounds like that, I'm looking to cut swaths of people out of Occupy and keep them off and just don't let them even come here because they're going to ruin it. I, I certainly don't mean to say that, because we're obviously an inclusive, please come down and join our, but do not sabotage us, do not undermine us, do not take over the group and, and turn it into preaching about what you want and shut everybody else up. You know, we don't, that's not how we play. You get a chance to talk, then you listen to other people, and then you hear, and, and if you can't do, deal with that, then you can't deal with Occupy. But, so we're willing to in, include anybody in the group. But I don't think 
that means we will accept every opinion as equally legitimate. But that's that's irrational. That's that yeah. doesn't make sense. I think uh, a lot of what needs to happen is we have to accept it. We're not all going to get along, just like there's not a single person in this movement that sees exactly eye to eye to me. There, there's somebody, at least every day, somebody brings up a point that I don't necessarily agree with, but do I go off and like, oh, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, and get mad at them over it? No. I realize, hey, sometimes you have to agree to disagree on a topic. That doesn't mean that the whole movement's messed up because of one person's ideals might be a little bit screwed up to you. You know what? Oh, well. You don't have to. You don't have to agree with that person. Doesn't mean that that's a bad person either. You know, there. Uh, I don't think there's been a single person that I've had multiple interactions with in my life that I've always seen everything the same way. And unfortunately, that's a lot of what people end up doing is like, "Hey, I don't see the same as you." This whole movement, uh, and it, it, it's a terrible way for people to try to interact with each other because it so limits your ability to learn more from people because. Tolerance and uh, it's more than just tolerance. It's uh, also your ability to gain information about topics that you might not agree with. Because just because, say, this person's misinformed about something, their ideals along the lines of that might not necessarily be a bad ideal. Or just because this person's not as intelligent doesn't mean that they don't know what they're talking about. And people tend to overlook those in people a lot, including themselves. You know, if if we could all just look at ourselves and then how we feel when we're treated those ways and and see how we're treating the other people around us in the process, it kind of helps you get past that whole, well, my idea's right, your idea's wrong. You know, because then you have to realize, well, what if I was right right, and I'm just being told I'm wrong, how does that feel to me? Or what if I was able to educate them on why I disagree with with that point of view rather than just get pissed off and walk away? Can I ask you a question? Uh Uh-huh. Has that changed for you since you've started doing the full-time stuff? Um, well... How has the Occupy changed you? For me, it kind of gave me uh, something to feel good about because now I, I'm, I'm blessed in the ability that I can be there 24 hours a day. Well, not necessarily 24 hours a day, but basically as much as a full-time job, if not more. Because of the fact that my lifestyle has been the way it is, I'm, I'm capable of it. You know, I've been looking for a job for like the past three years, but the fact that I'm not, not getting it had got me so depressed and feeling like I was worthless that now I'm over here, I'm like, okay, well, there's plenty of people that want to be out here. They can't because they've got to keep this, they've got this to t- worry about, they're trying to go there and get this achieved, but not because they don't care about the movement, it's because they, they're they trapped. Like, people become enslaved to the lifestyles that they that they've become comfortable in, and you know what? You're not going to change that for them. You need the person that can be out there that's got got the ability to deal with the elements, has an intellect, knows what the issues are, and can act, has the time. And in a lot of ways, like when I started up with the food table, for me that was like, I get to show, the, show everybody out here that just because I've been on the streets eight years doesn't mean I can't get out here and do it. It doesn't mean that I don't want to work. It just means that the option isn't there. I saw the option, I took it. That's happened. Which six... Solution. Which solution do you find the most exciting? So far as solutions, honestly, right now, the the, the trying to shut down Monsanto, I find to be the most exciting. I I, I am very action based. Uh, I do like I do like the protesting we've been doing with the foreclosure work group because it puts it out in the face and gets the message out. I love. Sorry, and, and I loved. Uh, the education rally because we were able to sit there after being ordered to disperse and maintain our presence and maintain peace, you know, and we got to show the officers how they they themselves are going to be treated by the one percent greed and cor- corruption as they're standing there and hearing the pieces all day. So. Hey, I just want to hear. She's got to go. I want to hear her last comment. She's got to blow up. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, like if there were a big tent or sort of like a house or something like that. I know that's always. Yeah. Um, if there were like one big tent or, or something like a house here, that would bring us all together to talk and to share our ideas and stuff, then I would totally be there. I wouldn't be there just like every Saturday. I would be there almost every day after school. And that's what I think of that. <laughs>
Thank you very much. I like this idea. Thank you very yeah. much. Sounds like a great idea. Let's work on it. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Good to see you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Ross. Hey, Ross. Yeah, we, we've been doing this. We skipped last week, but the four weeks previous. And like Saturdays at two. Okay. Yeah. Cool. This is the, the values, visions, and priorities discussion we talk. Cool. The old ones are up here. Well, I'm convinced that it's not dead yet. Yes. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. I think it's. We changed his mind. Not dead. I'll be back next week and we'll do this again. More puppies. In fact, it's one more puppies. It's pretty wonderful. <laughs> you gotta bring a couple. It's pretty wonderful. Call no us. Miles, hey, you got somebody who's paying attention to you. Well, one thought that's been um, uh, it's sticking with me. Was, we were talking earlier about you know the difficulty in finding sol uh, consensus on solutions and, and trying to figure out what what that shortlist looks like. Because the grievances we're pretty good at, and <laughs> and a lot of people understand those things, and and a, I think a big part of the mental block for us individually and collectively is is the the feeling that we have to commit to one or or to commit to a few, and and I I'm a big believer that every like everybody's got to take their strength and 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 push on er, uh, whatever front they they can do best at, and and we've got to do them all at the same time, and and and. It's tough with these numbers, but but we don't really have a choice, and um, and so I guess in, in terms of like the practical uh, mainstream uh, you know kinds of solutions, I, I've I've felt since day one that campaign finance, uh, you know, publicly financing all campaigns is something that we should be able to try to organize around it, and and that's a a first step towards solving all the other you know paralyzing set of problems. And, and so that's on, yeah. on the, like the practical, tangible front of like, oh, we gotta pass some laws and you know some other bullshit. Uh, <laughs> what is it? Yes. Fuck yeah. And then the so that's that's I feel like that's just my opinion of of, of the closest thing we have to consensus yeah. on on yeah. like practical solution. And then on on the intangible solution, I, I feel like. I, I wasn't as sure at the beginning, but I feel more and more that that it is trying to fight that fear, you know, fight the society of of fear and and not valuing money, uh, you know, not not valuing our classical material capital, but valuing social capital. You know, like you know, Ayn Rand is fine with me if you swap out material capital with social capital. If you fucking rock at helping the world. I want you to live good. I mean, like, but, but not not over all this bullshit. So that, those are my only thoughts. Well, I don't like. I don't think that we're going to be able to find a consensus because there's like so many people. Um, I like. I actually wish it were possible. I was I was really involved in Occupy UC Davis, but um, like I left the movement because. It, like we couldn't we couldn't it kind of fell apart we couldn't agree on stuff and it sort of got taken over by radicals who like refuse to listen to outside opinions and refuse to listen to like yeah, I felt uh, that too right? <laughs> yeah like and so it's Was just it easy, did you say? yes okay thank you and um i like i tried to um to suggest like um maybe having some sort of unifying like ideology or something and like they blocked the vote so yeah um but like i think what what occupy really has about it like i've said before but like um the fact that it's like a forum and it's a sustained forum like we're not going anywhere and like we may not be able to fight like every single battle that people bring to the table but everybody will be able to bring their battle to the table and by using Occupy as a vehicle to get it out there, they will find followers yeah. out there. So I think it's a really good springboard. What does this mean? Oh, I, I like it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Great job. Applause. Yeah, <laughs> Silent applause. Okay. Amen. Amen. In Davis it was Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've mm -hmm. been in the last in the last month we, we lost some uh, you know, some some of our regulars took a break, and and then I started trying to think of Occupy more as, as like the the connective tissue 
that you know brings us together, informs, mm -hmm. educates each other, both of like you know the information behind the causes, and then and then the actions that the causes are taking, and, and we all. I've been just, I've been more marches in the last three months than than the last three years. You know, even though I'm pretty active. <laughs> well, I, I guess in one, I, I, it's old school hippie thinking, I suppose. It's con consciousness raising. So we were always talking about consciousness raising. We need to raise the consciousness of the American people. We need to raise the consciousness. You select and we'll just we just add raise the consciousness up. And it meant that we felt like people were um, propagandized and conditioned and sold a bunch of goods and conned, and that it was our job to raise their consciousness to up to see see that. And that that's what we could do, you know. We weren't going to take up arms and, and blow away the establishment, but we could raise the consciousness of so many people that that would change the world. Now, I think we're still in the process of that. And that Occupy has raised the consciousness of the American people a few degrees more than anyone would ever expect you saying, how the hell did that happen? Well, I think it's because this country is hungry for little consciousness raising that feel they've been conned and played and manipulated and flim flammed and they're, j they're hungry for some truth but very skeptical at the same time. Very skeptical at the same time. You know, it's hard to believe. But It's like when we've been lied to so much, where do we go for answers and you know, I mean, all that kind of problem. And I think that it's kind I I feel like it's up to us to to form a cohesive answer that they say, well, what are you about? Well, this is kind of what we're about. You know, the 99 one, the, the, the money out of politics uh, can give you kind of the top five things that we really care about and then a thousand other things because there's so many things that need to be changed in the society. But there's kind of the top five that we really are behind, and if you don't get that, and we don't, you know, you probably don't get Occupy. But if you got that, and then you're probably a member of Occupy. You know, you've got the spirit of Occupy, and we're we're having trouble getting that message out to the American people because it gets distorted, because the corporate media doesn't really like what we have to say, and would rather distort it and turn it around into something that they can control. And we keep coming back saying, no, that's not what we're about. <laughs> Let us explain channel. it to you. Why don't you ask us it's what it's about instead of Rush Limbaugh? I don't <laughs> think he really knows. Ask us. <laughs> and when they do, to have kind of a coherent statement. I, you know, I keep saying, every time they, you hear on the mass media, what is Occupy about, they always tell the same story. I went to, to Occupy, I went and talked to 50 di di people, and I got 50 different answers as to what Occupy is about. And that's what Occupy is. It's 500 different people with 500 different answers, and they think that they're doing something together, but they're not. They're just kind of keeping each other company. And it's a hard argument to, to um, fight with. I'm sorry, yes sir, sir, speak up. Speak to us. I just. This is my first time at this group. I understand this is the vision group. But I would really kind of like to see, and I don't know if anybody's interested, but if you could put it in a couple sets, go around this group and find out what everybody thinks. You know what I think? You know what my vision is for Occupy? What I would like to see them do? Real quick, build community. You know what I think the problem is with America? People got sleepies in their eyes. The TV owns their mind. Come out and talk to us. Community. You know what's more dangerous than AK-47? A community garden. An idea. A place where people go and get a yeah. hole An and start working next to each other and saying, Hi, what was your day about, friend? Because if neighbors did that, we wouldn't have to listen to all this madness all the time. What's on television right now is pure insanity. Criminal minds. 
I mean, this is what they they come on and they say this show is called Criminal Minds. That's entertainment. That's oh true. My God. Oh my God. Are you crazy? <laughs> Good point. That other show they put on, C-SPAN. <laughs> uh, I watch C-SPAN. Uh, Criminal Minds. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> okay. Let's see. <laughs> so, which solution are you most excited about? Well. My issue is kind of specific. No solution. Which solution? Okay, I'll tell you where I spent my morning doing because it was working on my solution. Cool. Um, I'm with Safe Ground. We're about the homeless. So we're trying to make a community. We're trying to acquire land and put people on it in basically little pool shed type buildings. Then we're going to get them to talk to each other. And we're going to get them off the dope. Because the dope is coming from all the wrong places. Now right now, the problem we had all morning, we were down, we picked out a piece of land. We've been around talking to the neighbors all morning. Trying to see what our resistance is going to be. Because we got a long, hard fight in City Hall. If we're going to win it, we have to get the community on our side. So that's what we, they're scared of the homeless. You know, and I don't blame them to some extent. What they see is craziness. But it's, it's just a symptom of what's going on in the rest of society is all. The homeless aren't the only ones that do drugs. It's True. just they don't have a home to hide behind. So they can't hide the dirt. You know, and, and people don't realize that. So the problem is, what are we going to do about drugs? And if we keep hiding the problem, we'll never get to the answer. Community. Well, that's, your, that's what you're most excited about. That's what I spent my morning so, doing. So your solution that you're most excited about is community, right? I think so. Okay. I like that. <laughs> I hear that, yeah. And if anybody else has ideas, I think we should... I think you've got a I'm, great idea. I'd like I want to listen from now on. Okay? I would just say, Thank you. as far as I'm concerned, we could make a, a statement. There should be no more homeless and hungry in the United States. There should be no homeless and there should be no hungry. Period. If other countries can do it, so can we. Yeah. yeah. That's a good point. Libya, Libya didn't have one homeless person. Are, are really? No. Nope. Wow. Before we came in and talked to us stuff you, up. You know what? Did anybody know that? I didn't yeah. know that. You so, know what's interesting? Did y'all hear what she said? Say that. Said Libya, Libya did not have one homeless person because Gaddafi gave every single person a roof over their head. Everyone so had they had apartment. no homeless. They had Libya. no homeless. He actually, his parents lived in a like a little mm -hmm. tent, and he vowed to like because people were living in tents, and he vowed that his parents would live in a tent until he housed everyone, and he kept his word. His dad died in the tent, and he finally housed his mom after every single Libyan had a house or an apartment type. You know. Wow. Yeah. That is so interesting. Yep. Wow. Oh, and they all get a portion of the oil revenue too, by the way, into their bank accounts. How about that? So what From solution are you most excited about, sir? Um, kind of about what he was talking about, just the sh paradigm shift in our consciousness, the way we think, and the paradigm shift in our consciousness, the human consciousness, the way we uh, deal with tolerance and, and acceptability, I don't know what's right here, but yeah, just a change in consciousness of humanity, probably. And community as well. I, I, I like these ideas of community and, and raising consciousness. And, and, and my fear of them is that they will be called socialism and communism and they're easily attacked from the right. And the issue that I really focus on more than solutions, I guess, because I don't think solutions really fits what I think um, the direction needs to be. Um, but for me, it's about um, it's about saying that the status quo and the, and the power structure that is currently in place will not allow any of those kinds of movements. None of those solutions can move forward. But a change with of consciousness will allow that. Uh, yes. That has Can't to start it, first. That has to be the first thing that changes. But change of consciousness, I, I I could be wrong, so I, I'm open to mulling this over, but I don't think a change in consciousness is actually going to uh, 
unravel the power structure. I mean, because as as you as you start going out and changing people's consciousness and telling them the truth, we're having a backlash from the right, which is telling us that everything everything on the the educated left, you might say, is telling people, you know, we have global climate issues, we have pollution issues, we get uh, we got into a war under false pretenses. And they want to hear none of that. In fact, they just label it all. It's real easy for them to just label it Who is they? a conspiracy. What happens, what happens the right. when you throw a cog in a machine? What happens to that <laughs> machine? That machine breaks down, and that's the whole point. The truth will break the machine do. down, I think. Is it with that's, the cog? That's what, that's what I'm saying. Oh, yes. I agree with that. But and you, even though you have these people on the right, these, you know, if, if, if you throw a cog in the machine, the machine will break down eventually, and then we can start from scratch. Yeah. Right, but the place that the, the place to direct your energy, I believe, is not at the distractions that the right is putting out there, like teaching creationism in schools and cutting education. I mean, they are going after everything, including privatizing parking meters. Oh and, yeah, and we're, we got it from so every end. No, okay. because they are prop ups. They are distractions Which from power, on. maintaining power, and keeping our, our 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 eyes off of what's really going on. We suggest? are being fleeced so what you big time. On? The wealthy are taking the money out of this country. They're buying up everything oh, in course. every kind of economic right. way. They can take advantage and set themselves up They're for the up collapse. They're too, setting themselves so up for our collapse. On? Oh yeah, that's kind of that power structure. The power structure. The power structure. If we allow ourselves to be focused so in my world, yeah. if I allow, you know, every time I hear the, 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 you know, myself getting involved in, in, in a lot of the social issues and even the economic issues, like the solutions or the what should we do piece, it loses focus out of the fact that no matter what laws we pass. They're going to be the ones interpreting it. No, They're going to be the ones that rewrite right. the laws. I agree with you. So the way I look at it is like is um, like a family tree or like a pyramid. You have all of these issues down here on the bottom. And they all stem up. They all end up going to one place. What do you think that one place is that we need to focus on? Are those, those people or what do you think that is that we need to focus on? What do I think the top of the pyramid is? Yes. That we need to focus on. Well, it's your model. So you tell me. I, I What do we need to focus because on is... The uh, the power structure, which which basically controls how we see things, it, it controls how money is distributed, what we even think so money like is. The Federal Reserve could be the biggest one, but but that's, the, but that's uh, that was I all set up by the wealthy class. Yes, I know. We know. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm yeah. not trying to talk like no, you don't fine. know. It's fine. But um, but the more we keep focusing on, hey, we've been told lies over and over, and the lies are so extensive that that's what we got to get that's for me. That's consciousness. That's consciousness. That, well, it is consciousness. Yes, it is. Yes, yes, yes it, it is. is. Don't, unless you're going to completely... It's change. social. You I'll, I'll give you that. Sure. It's consciousness right. raising, but in a social consciousness as opposed to a personal oh, consciousness. Because sometimes when I hear this one, it's about personal consciousness raising. I just want to point something out. Okay. When you talk about the backlash of the right, we are living in the backlash of the right from the counterculture and the hippies of the 60s. They made hay out of that whole movement and the, mo the after Ronald Reagan, we moved right. I took a right turn away from the culture of the hippies, away from the culture of raising consciousness, away from the communist uh, hippies. Right. And they trashed them and they made that the, the, the government, I mean, that the movement and they ridiculed it and broke it. Right. And what we have left is the right wing government, the reaction formation. Occupy is the second wave of reaction saying, you did not kill us. We are not dead. We are not destroyed. In fact, we finally have figured out what the hell you're doing and we are exposing it. We're bringing out, and it's just not the little hippies out in the corner. There's an Occupy right. in every city in this damn right. country. Okay, I'm sorry. That's my comment.
what was it that happened in the 70s that was the manipulation? Because people don't step into manipulation consciously, they step into it unconsciously. So what was the trick? What was it that happened? Was it, oh guess what, we better, did somebody in a boardroom all across the United States go, gosh, we better do something. Well, let's all agree to like dump money in and then everybody will think that things are okay and things got better and then suddenly the me generation or me decade happened. So, so we can still go back and go, okay, now we're here again. What can we do differently? How can we make sure to stay away and not come to the same manipulation and succumb to the same quasi-solution or quasi-improvement. How do we keep our eyes that, you know, maybe, you know, because there's a lot of people out there that don't really want to give up those four hundred And they've got so much resources that they can actually create an illusion of success. Of things have changed. Oh, I've become enlightened. Just tell me what you want me to say and I'll say it because it doesn't cost you for me to lie. <laughs> you know, and so so thinking forward, you know, about about you know, going even farther back than the sixties. That didn't start in the sixties. This has been going on for for hundreds and hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. So what happened? Why did it fail? What happened? How did it fail? How can we be better at this? How can we really, really take this down inside and not so much in the verbal, not so much in the cerebral, but really look at ourselves as a part of the humanity that we're all a part of. We can't just look at it like it's something happening outside of us. It's happening inside. And so how am I susceptible to that manipulation? How would I, I gotta ask myself, that's what I promised to ask myself, how am I susceptible to the manipulation of going back to sleep and getting the sleep back in my eyes? But, um, but you were saying just a little while ago about, about the addiction. I was thinking about that this morning, about how powerful our country would be if we got rid of addiction completely across the board and how much more awake and that would be maybe one of the manipulations. Yeah. It's like, you know, I've heard about that before, that there was a whole bunch of drugs put out, like, it's not deregulation, but the quasi-regulation of drugs, mm -hmm. and to actually make it more available to help that sleep even be more sleepy. Mm -hmm. So, one of the things, maybe I'll talk to uh, Sister Libby, I don't know if you guys have teachings, like that book I was talking about last week, about Buddha's brain. It is so educational to me. I'm so much more aware of how even my emotions are addictive. Mm -hmm. And how like it explains at the cellular level what happens. It kind of gives me a sense of control over my own body. And I know that in some places they actually offer like classes and stuff that actually explain why is alcohol addictive and marijuana isn't? Why is cocaine so addictive? It's right up there next to heroin. You know, what is it that the body is going through so that people don't feel like it's a moral issue? It really is a mechanical one, actually. You know, it's just like, oh. But being educated about that kind of stuff, I think, is very powerful. So those are the things that are you going to teach doing. anything? Are you going to teach this? Or you no, I think there's people who can say it a lot better, much more eloquent. They, they teach people on what addiction is and what things I'd are. love to take that, whatever you're... <laughs> can you, can you organize it? Or? I'll go talk to Sister Libby about it. It sounds like that's what that's, you, know, you were saying. Media counterattack. You can trace it to Charlie Manson and whatever, changing the, the love and peace of the Beatles over to Charlie Manson and the, the family, the whole, just mischaracterization and, and defilement of the movement. And it was ridiculed and labeled as communists and drug users and uh, long-haired hippies and whatever, and we can ignore them. We don't have to listen to what they said. We don't have to care what they talked about. None of it means anything. They were all on drugs. They were all crazy. They were all communists. And we bought that. I mean, the greater society bought that. And I think it's being rethought again. These are not the same crazy old hippies. It's just... But they're, they're calling us the same thing. They're right. The media's doing the exact doing the same, same thing. thing. The same the people thing. in the Occupy movement, they're saying they're homeless, they're the fringes of society, they're drug addicts, which means that 
they don't count. Their opinion doesn't count. And they're just trying to uh, make your average person out there not want to look at you or not want to listen to what you're saying. Yep. But when you said what changed in the 70s, I think it was education. I think that because I'm an a educator and teachers in the 70s, it started in the late 70s and 80s and it's like, you know, really well enforced now. Teachers lost their voice completely in the classroom. Education became scripted. It was almost like, you know, Big Brother and, and you know, then the, the parents, even the hippies, you know, kids, the hippies, a lot of them went out where I'm from in the South. They went back to the land and said, we're just going to live simple lives and we're going to bring our kids up to love one another and to respect diversity and all this. But when, but then they would arrest the parents if they didn't put them in school. And so they had to send their kids to school. And now there's two generations of people that have gone through public schools. And, you know, they don't even... They don't even know about what happened in the 60s. They don't even know about civil rights that happened in the early 60s. You know, they don't understand that people can have a struggle and overcome because they've never seen it. And they, what I saw, I taught elementary school, the kids are addicted to sugar. They live off of sugar. And sugar is as addictive as uh, tobacco, which is as addictive as heroin. They're all really strong drugs. But, but you don't think of it, you know, I mean, we know, we say, oh, it's not healthy for the kids to have a soda, let's take the soda machines out of the schools, well, then they put this pink and green and orange sugar water in little, cute, you know, paper cartons and give it to them, but, so I feel like we got to pull our kids out of school, and, you know, you got to teach, or teach them, you know, before they go to school about your the values. They say a person's values are formed by the time they're seven years old. Hmm. So make keep your kids home. Don't send them to school till they're eight. You know, They've been make, indoctrinated in school. Oh, they're being indoctrinated at yeah. school. You can count on that. Yeah. Between oh, yeah. school and TV and all these addictions and distractions. I mean, I can't tell you how many teachers and principals I've met that said, I'm going to homeschool my grandkids. I'm going to retire and then I'm going to homeschool <laughs> my grandkids. I would to this school. <laughs> yeah, I never exactly. let them come to this school. <laughs> Oh dear, have, have we gone past, yes, we've gone past, should we have a GA? Should we just do it right here? It's tempting. Why don't we just do it right here? Oh wow, it was in the water. We don't need to move. Why they built the Roman Colosseum, they all went insane with heavy metal poison. Because it's lust for sweet. But wasn't it from the uh, this lust for the sweet? Water, the lust for sweet. They, they were using they, they had lead in the pipes too, but they were using lead acetate as sugar on their cereal oh. and eating straight up lead. It's what drove them all that crazy. Is, that's interesting. I agree with you about sugar too. Sugar is addictive. It's it's addictive. Support addictive what you're saying. Addictive. And that's why all the kids are so hyper now, and then the way right. you take them to the doctor, and the doctor doesn't say quit giving them sugar. He's like, give them this drug, which is just addictive. Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> so now they're on two drugs. They're Boring, upper and they're downer. Here's you know? some sugar. Here's oh, some too sugar. hyper? Have some Ritalin. <laughs> exactly. That's it. And the pharmaceutical companies are laughing all the way to the bank. Yeah, yeah. And the sugar company, <laughs> which are kind of a pharmaceutical company, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> Do we want a little uh, five-minute break or something before we start? Thank <laughs> you.